So what else is new with you guys? How's everything going? It's all cool. It's all great. Welcome back to Launchpad. I'm Christian Reddy, your friendly neighborhood astronomer. Also tonight, your very annoyed astronomer. Uh, I really am very sorry for all the technical difficulties we've been we had this evening. This was quite bizarre, but I can see that I'm being seen, and that is wonderful. Thank you all very much, and thank you for sticking around and waiting for us. Again, my name is Christian Reddy. For those of you who don't know, this is Launchpad Astronomy, and in my day job, I'm also a professor at Towson University, where I am the director of the Watson King Planetarium. Given that we normally would do planetarium shows on the third Friday of every month, well, given that we would, except for, like, the thing, you know, uh, I uh, just thought we could do these online. And uh, when, when we do planetarium shows online, it's kind of hard to do planetarium shows per se. And since we are running just a few minutes late, I thought I would just jump right on in uh, to our topic this evening. Because if you are looking in the direction of the constellation Orion... That's that unmistakable constellation with the, you know, kind of looks like what it says on the tin, right? It looks like a hunter, it's got the belt on and all that kind of stuff. Well, when you are looking in that general direction, what you may not realize is that you may in fact be looking in the direction of an unseen planet lurking at the very outer edges of our solar system. At least that is according to my two guests tonight, uh, which, uh, if you'll bear with me as I literally try to reconfigure everything from, you know, what I had starting out to what I had to do after I rebooted. But my guests tonight are Dr. Mike Brown uh, at uh, Caltech University and uh, pr a professor of uh, planetary astronomy and Constantine Batygin, uh, a theorist as well as an astrophysicist at Caltech. And by the way, Mike is also the author of How I Killed Pluto and Why It Had It Coming. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, it's that guy, Mike Brown and Constantine Batygin. Also, the people who firmly believe that there is a thing as a ninth genuine bona fide planet at least according to you two gentlemen gentlemen good evening and welcome hey, Hi, Christian. all right so again i'm going to be adjusting the audio levels and maybe the camera brightnesses as we have to uh tonight again apologies for all the uh all the goof ups but um we've uh what i what i've been i've been a bit of a fan of your work and i shouldn't say a fan but yeah i've been interested in what you guys have been doing i mean it's uh because you're claiming that there's a planet out there, and yes, I know people are saying there's Plutos and I have planets before, but we're not talking about that. We're not talking about a dwarf planet. We are, in fact, or you are, in fact, describing or fairly convinced that there is a planet out there that has to be very substantial in mass and something way beyond maybe even a terrestrial-sized planet. Um, I was wondering if you could tell tell us a little bit about how you came to this uh, hypothesis, uh, Mike. We yeah, I mean, or Tansi, we could talk yeah, to you. Yeah, start with go, you. I mean, look, what, it so, all started. To... <laughs> go Mike, ahead. Go for it. Go ahead, Mike. Um, so, so it really, really all started with a a couple of different disparate observations that other astronomers had made. Some of them actually we had made ourselves, uh, even starting back as early as the the 2003 discovery of the very, very distant dwarf planet Sedna, which was in this very strange elongated orbit sort of pulled away from uh, the rest of the, the solar system, which was strange. We came up with some ideas on where it was. Then, then other astronomers realized that there were uh, these objects, which are called centaurs, which are things that come in close to the to the sun, close means about the orbit of Jupiter. That's close to us, close to the sun, but then go really far away, and that this was potentially evidence for something strange, some maybe a planet in the outer solar system. Then some other astronomers uh, realized that there was some weird patterns going on in the outer part of the solar system, and and looking at all these things together. Um, Constantine and I realized what uh, what what finally put all those different pieces into to, to make them all make sense. We realized what was really going on is that there is a set of very distant Kuiper Belt objects that are all on these elongated orbits going around the sun like this, and they're all kind of fanned off in one direction. And 
after a lot of time of trying really hard to convince ourselves that it was not because there's a planet out there because that just seemed dumb people you know everybody knows there's not another planet out out past neptune um but we really came to the conclusion that there really is no other explanation for that behavior that we're seeing in the uh, the most distant solar system than a a planet maybe six times the mass of the earth so like the 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 legitimate fifth largest planet of our whole solar system um, out at some distance that's like uh, 10 or 20 times the distance of Neptune. So so really large, but really, really far away. So when you're saying, okay, so again, there's a few things we probably ought to unpack there really quick. I mean, you you're, you're wow. gave a great overview there, but obviously the first thing we have to uh, dispel anybody that's can that has i think you've called it the lunchbox model right you know there's sun the planets and so forth and it's all right there the solar system is a lot bigger than we think right what we think of as the outer solar system jupiter saturn and so forth that's really more like the middle part of the solar system then you've got regions even further beyond you've got the kuiper belt mm -hmm. but you're talking about even beyond the kuiper belt am i correct i don't understand yeah yeah, so these are these are objects that are that are further out than even other oh, Sedna. So here's here is uh, this this was one of the figures we made way back um, almost 20 years ago when we discovered Sedna, and you can see what's weird about Sedna. Here's the the solar system, Jupiter, Saturn. You're, I, does my mouse show up on here or not? No, I actually, Mike, happen. this is mine. But if you'd like to, we okay. could switch over to yours if you if you have your slide up. Uh, this is fine, but you can see you know the 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 giant planets there. You can even see Pluto just for entertainment, even though it's not a planet. And then you see this uh, the orbit of <laughs> Sedna on this very elong elongated orbit, much, much further out than the than the planets. And the other objects that we, we realized were also part of this family of objects are also on orbits very much like that, uh, that, that have similar, very distant um, orbits to them. So, so this is, uh, I'm just showing the orbit of Sedna here, uh, and there's more of a zoomed out version of it. And again, this is, this is Neptune's orbit, folks, right here in purple, right? That's what we're talking about. So we're, we're way out there. And by the way, we already have, a, we already have our first super chat. Holy mackerel. I can't believe it. Uh, it's, are there any compelling hypotheses for what's been observed? Well, I think we're about to answer that question if I, uh, if I understand the question correctly. Uh, but thank you so much for the super chat. It's very generous. So I'm gonna to try to get to all of your questions tonight uh, as, as quickly as I can. Uh, but um, again, just kind of doing some of the setup work here and I'm just really just trying to show the, uh, uh, so this is, I think, an artist's impression of Sedna. Is that correct? Yeah, if you show if you show my slides, you can see. Yeah, let's go back um, to yours. Yeah, for sure. Uh, so let me get to. Okay, there you are, Mike. Oh, and I have to add your again, folks. My apologies. We had the uh, we had that little problem with uh, oh, you know, getting having to restart everything, and I'm kind of rebuilding it as we go. Are you sharing your screen, Mike? I am. Uh, oh no, I'm not. Look at that. So I was ah, okay. before, and then I so, wasn't. So let's do that. Oh, uh, and wow, we have another very generous super chat from Nicholas Paulson. Uh, from thank you for having Dr. B on. He's a cool guy. I've learned a ton from him watching his lectures. Yeah, me too. You know what? He he's got a fantastic free course on solar system science. Uh, we should be plugging that as well. All right. So I think I see your. I think I see your. Uh, uh, I do believe I yeah. see your slides. I'm gonna go ahead and. Oh my goodness, we. There we go. We have your name screen. Okay, great. So you're up. Okay, you are up and running, Mike. Okay, so you can see this this tiny little circle right there. That's the orbit of Neptune. And um, that's the tiny circle that's in the center, barely discernible amid the glow, yeah. right, of the sun. Uh, Sedna is this one right here in slightly different color purple. Okay. And then these these other distant objects you can see are on these very distant orbits that go very far away, come back in to this region of the Kuiper Belt. And they're all splayed off in this direction. Those were the original six objects that we we uh, first recognized as special and and telling us something. As of now, um, there are I'd say there are about thirteen that are kind of doing that same thing that are continuing to reinforce that mm. story that there's something going on out there. 
so when you so you said these are just the original uh, you said that these were just the original six objects uh, th those are just the original six objects but were there more objects that I mean like okay you see six and that's pretty that's cool that's nifty but that's not prima facie proof or evidence of a planet nine is there? heck yeah it is yeah oh, well look okay. I mean <laughs> on the, <laughs> here we have to be Right, we have to be careful because there there are more objects in the distant Kuiper belt than there are the original six. And in fact, even the original six, only four of them are the ones that really count, uh, largely because you only want to look at the orbits that are stable, okay? The objects that are not being whipped around and perturbed strongly by Neptune. Now. Uh, if you kind of look at how the data set has progressed since 2016, uh, here, can you fire up my slides real quick? Um, yeah, so this is where, yeah, uh, this is, yeah, this is what the data set looks like now. And as you can see, there's a strong propensity to a whole, to have a whole bunch of orbits all pointing in the common direction, but there's also, you know, they're also differently colored. Uh, here, the green ones are the ones that are interacting with Neptune so strongly that they don't really tell you anything. They're the mm -hmm. ones that are chaotically uh, be diffusing and in any case are kind of on their way out of the solar system. You should only really focus your eye on the purple and the metastable, the stable purple and the metastable gray orbits. And what you'll see is that the data set has more than doubled over the course of the last five years. And this tendency for the objects to cluster together in physical space is very much still there. Now, we have done a considerable amount of work to ask ourselves the question of, is this by chance? Is this uh, some sort of, you know, an observational bias? And, and the simple answer is that well, there is a chance. It's and it's one in 500. So so when you if you don't believe what the data are telling you, you are making a one in 500 bet against the house, if you will. How do you determine uh, that it's one in, one chance in 500 that that is a just a purely chance alignment? Like where do you know? I mean, clearly, that's not a number you're pulling out of the air. That's how, no, no. How so look, you... this is actually work that that Mike led. So I think Mike should explain this particular sure. thing. It. It it was a it was a substantial body of work. So the 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 hard part is you you could imagine if if for some dumb reason astronomers only looked at the sky in one direction, then all the objects you would find would be in that direction and and nothing would be meaningful in that sense. And uh, and and some people suggested when we first saw this pattern that that's what was going on basically. And so there, there's always a chance, you know, there's always a chance that it's, it's not the, that astronomers are dumb and only look in one direction, but what if the weather is always better in one season than another? It's also not really true because these observations have taken place all around the world. So it's, it's a little bit hard to make those arguments. Nonetheless, it's an important argument to rule out. So we actually um, went through a very exhaustive analysis of the discovery of every single body in the Kuiper belt and understood which direction people were looking when they found it, how bright it was, what it tells us about the circumstances and how that influenced the other discoveries out there. And then we can say, yeah, it is true actually, in one direction, there's a little bit bigger chance to find it because the weather is better in the Northern hemisphere and a lot of the observations in the Northern hemisphere. And so we can take that into account and ask ourselves the question with, with understanding all of those, what we call them observational biases, understanding all those observational biases What's the chance that we would get a clustering as strong as the clustering is that we see today? And that's the answer that Constantine said. It's, it's, uh, it's one in 500. So probably that cluster is because there's a cluster. You know, when you see a cluster like that, it's a good chance there's a cluster. I, I mean, one of the things that I think is really compelling to me is that five years ago when we had half as much data, um, we said, look, if we're wrong, the next set of discoveries will be spread across the sky uniformly and this will disappear. It didn't happen. We doubled the size of the data and the signal just got stronger. That's pretty good evidence that what you're seeing is something that's real. 
Uh, the that... other, so I, just to add to this, the other yeah, thing sure. that you know I find interesting is that if you look at the data, the, you can really see the dynamical effect, right? You can see that the orbits that are purple, that are not interacting strongly with Neptune and that are, have the chance yeah. to be shepherded by whatever gravity is further away, are better aligned than the ones that are being whipped around by Neptune. You can talk about all kinds of observational biases, weather or galactic plane, yada, yada, yada. It's impossible to have an observational bias that somehow selects for dynamical stability on billion year timescales. That's you know, something that say, theory predicts. I, I would like to say that Constantine, who really started this game as a purely theoretical astrophysicist, just made a really smart observational point that it had never occurred to me before. You and I have not talked about that. That's a really good point. Um, I'm going to steal that one from you. Like, it, it's almost like you understand observations now. What, what's going on well, here? I don't, I, that, that is an illusion, okay? It is an illusion. I understand nothing about so, observations. All right, so, but I, no, but so, so you're, 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 you're sure you're not Super veering out of your lane, Constantine? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he actually, like, it's been pretty fun. So he and I have taught each other a lot. Yeah. Um, and I, I can pretend to know a little bit of theory and, uh, he's, he like understands the sky in ways that I don't think Look, most uh, theoretical astronomers do. Mostly what, what I learned is that, is that observing is hard cause you got to stay up the entire night. Like that's, yeah. oh, that's yeah. a, oh yeah. Yeah. It's BS as well. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it's, it's, it's not fun. Uh, and, and you're right. It, it's, it's a. I mean, I've done it myself, uh, you know, I, although at least I think when you guys were at your telescope, you were inside a warm room. You see, back in my day, no, I'm just kidding. Uh, but yeah, um, it, it, is, it is long and tedious work. And uh, it, to that end, um, you know, you've had five years. So how come you haven't found it yet? Right. I mean, you know. What's, well, I, I would say the, the shorter answer is the sky is a big place. Yeah, um, it's it's a very weird search that we're doing um per, unlike anything that has really happened successfully um in uh in a couple centuries if we are saying there's one object for which we're looking and it's somewhere in the sky and we have good predictions on the path that it takes through the sky but not on where along the path is and so trying to find a single object in the sky means you have to you have to cover a lot of the sky and you have to cover it repeatedly and you have to get lucky to make sure that the thing you're looking for wasn't right next to a really bright star the day you the night you happen to look it's a it's a really difficult thing to find one single object in the sky when you don't know where it is that's faint we're and up, moving we're up all night we're up all night to get lucky that's what we do it's but also exactly true. Look, you know the other thing that i found out uh sort of doing uh, doing this search together with Mike is that, you know, theory, you can do theory uh, anywhere, right? You can, in fact, it is better done in weird places with observing. It's not like, you know, every night we get up and take a look and say, oh yeah, today is not the night, right? The number of actual observations, successful observational, uh, you know, campaigns that we've had is so limited and this yeah, is because yeah. this is such a sensitive search everything's got to go right you know and it goes everything goes right so rarely and and by bad luck the the when we're looking for it the 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 sky as you as you showed is kind of the region of orion that region of orion is up overhead all night in december ish mm -hmm. um our survey is happening on mauna kea december in mauna kea is not a great place to be unless you want to take the you know opportunity to ski in hawaii that's uh we've had op often had those opportunities to uh to bring our skis with us and go down the hill but doesn't mean <laughs> you're, you're doesn't mean you're observing those nights well i i to that end i what i like to do we've had just loads and loads of questions first of all i should say there's like 254 people watching thank you all for for joining us tonight this is this is so exciting. Um, if I may, uh, if, if will you guys be up for a few questions here? We got like, oh, a ton. We're ready. Okay. Uh, and so folks, what I'm doing is I'm just going to, I'm just scrolling back through the uh, comments and I'm trying to figure out, is there a question there? And uh, I'm just going to 
start hitting them. So if I don't get to your question, feel free to ask it again. I'll do my best to get to it. But uh, Trevor Fever asks, is it a gas planet or a rocky one? Well, I, that kind of... Uh... I know the answer. I know the answer. I know okay, the answer. go ahead. Yes. Okay, you heard it here. Why, <laughs> wait a minute. Um, what? Yeah, well, look, we, we cannot say anything about the planet. All we can say is the gravitational field and the orbit that it occupies. We have ways to calculate that. We can't say anything about the planet itself. It could be a burrito. Hmm. Could be, could be, you know, Mike. Chimichanga. It might be a, yeah, chimichanga, hamburger. It could be any of these things, or it could be a rocky planet or an icy one, or uh, preferably it would be an icy one with a little bit of a gas atmosphere so that it's easier to observe but really we don't know anything about five earth mass planets we don't have a close up analog okay and well you you, you, know. ju you just you just zeroed in on something i don't think we've covered yet and that is you said that you you estimate that this planet would need to have a mass of about five times earth's mass six times six five to six 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 okay. not five Definitely right. not five. So Constantine's uh, for five, for six. Uh, folks in the chat, please tell us what you think is the mass of this planet. Uh, but... so, so, let, so let me say, um, as, as much as we are we are being honest about uh, our ignorance about the nature of the planet, yeah. we do have we have our we have hypotheses about what it is likely to be, which are just informed by what we think about where it came from and the evolution of the solar system. Frequently, what we think about where things came from and the evolution is wrong, so you should take it all with a with a grain of salt. But uh, hmm. Our, our our favorite hypothesis for how it got there is that it's a, a planet much like Uranus or Neptune formed in the same region as Uranus and Neptune and got ejected to the outer parts of the solar system and has been hanging around there ever since then. So my guess is that it is a sort of a ice, icy gassy planet like Uranus and Neptune. Um, but if I'm wrong about that guess, it would not surprise me all that much because we are frequently wrong about things we don't know about the solar system and, and planets in general. So uh, it could be a super Earth or a mini Neptune or something in between. Because of, be. Earth is one Earth mass, I think. Uh, Neptune is 14 Earth masses. So five kind of five to six kind of puts it. Yeah. 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 I mean, look, the exciting thing about all this is that five Earth masses appears, a five Earth mass object appears to be a dominant outcome of the planet formation process throughout the galaxy. Most exoplanets that we found are sort of in that, in that size and mass range. So um, this would be the closest thing we'll have to a window to kind of really zero in and study the most common type of planet in in the galaxy, the galaxy right yeah yeah mo most of most of the planets out there are in this intermediate range and we don't have anything like that nearby um, yeah we do well i mean nearby nearby because how far <laughs> are we talking how how far what is the semi-major axis of this planet we could well i mean, I mean okay, we, we so showed we showed the slide earlier we yeah, have yeah, neptune's yeah. orbits <laughs> way down here and then you got this great big ellipse yeah. So, Dromo, yeah, please. So, I was actually beating yeah. up on Constantine, not a Dromo. <laughs> well, look, look, I mean, uh, uh, we're about this, uh, that it's hundreds of astronomical units. Uh, what we disagree about are the error bars, and, uh, and I think I'm right. Um, but, um, you know, I would venture a guess that the semi-major axis is something like 500. Uh, I'm okay with that. Uh, I'm, okay with two, I'm okay with 500. <laughs> I'm okay with 500. All right. All right. Okay. All right. So, uh, so I guess I'm trying to go through a few of these other questions here. Uh, hey, we had some, we had some super questions, right? Are we supposed to answer the super questions? We, we, we are. Uh, yeah. I would like to go ahead and give the super chat since they were generous enough to, to donate. I want to yeah. give them a kind of a, a heads up here. Uh, wow. Well, okay. So, um, Super chat, twenty dollars. Thank you so much for the super chat. Thank you for sharing time. Thank you for this. Regarding the potential formation of Planet Nine, what do you think of David Nezo well, Nezabornis? Yeah. I messed that up. Theory about Pluto kicking it out of its orbit. Uh, look, so there's there's two different uh, 
models out there that talk about kicking things out of the solar system. The one that David has worked on and, and we worked on as well back in, I guess, 2012. Yeah. Was it? We were yeah, young it was a little long. <laughs> yeah. um, well, look, it's that that model almost certainly has nothing to do with Planet Nine. And here's why. Um, let me backtrack a little bit. The idea here is that the solar system formed in a more compact configuration. And then as the uh, gas went away, you know, during the kind of period of the solar system's transient instability, one planet could have been ejected. Could it have been planet nine? I think no, because during this time, you have to form the Oort cloud, okay? The, the Oort cloud where the long period the really long period comets come from had to have formed during this uh, ejection of icy material into the distant realms. While this is happening, the solar system cannot be embedded in its birth cluster, okay? Because if it's there, then the, the passing stars in the birth cluster of the sun would have made the orbit cloud unbound. This means that there wouldn't have been the perturbations from the passing stars to park planet nine into its orbit so all of this goes to say that if uh that the interactions the ejection that would have produced planet nine predated the nisvorni ejected planet so i'm, I'm not sure i buy that but but okay <laughs> okay well you know <laughs> sounds uh, good let me let me uh let me bring up this next uh super chat uh let's see here i why can't i uh okay super chat from rick thank you so much rick i wonder if the vera rubin telescope will help to find planet nine mike seems extraordinarily skeptical but uh i'll go ahead mike and would you mind sharing your thoughts as to why my my prediction if i had to bet money right now um i would bet that the vera rubin telescope finds planet nine so so here's why. For for those who haven't been paying attention, the Vera Rubin Telescope, uh, the one that used to be called the LSST, is the new big telescope that they're building in, in uh, Chile that's going to basically survey the entire sky once every approximately three nights um, with about a six-meter telescope. There it is. And it is going to be fantastic. And so if, if we have not found Planet Nine by the time this starts operating, Planet Nine is not going to be able to hide um, from from this machine, which is just going to be so amazing, it's it'll do a lot of different things. But for me, it's just it's going to be finding so many of the moving objects out there in the outer solar system, Planet Nine amongst them. So my hope is that we find it before then, because it'd be more fun to find it before then. But I, I like to think of, of uh, Vera Rubin as as the big back backstop that will make sure that Planet Nine gets found. And so I think that's going to be coming online. Uh, well, I know that they had a pause construction. Uh, due to the pandemic, so I don't know what the expected first light uh, science operations uh, dates are going to be. Uh, let me get to another one. Wow, we got another one from I spammed out. Oh, th <laughs> <laughs> thanks, man. <laughs> you guys are so generous. I, it, it, and, and folks, listen, you don't have to. I'm trying to give them priority, but uh, you know, please, is not to say. And if you're a student of mine, you're you're by definition broke. So don't don't do that. Um, if this planet was both ejected from its initial orbit and is near other objects that aren't orbiting it, wouldn't that mean it would technically be a dwarf planet due to not having cleared its neighborhood? Ooh. I mean, no. It's, it's... <laughs> yeah. That is the correct answer. <laughs> well, I think, I think it's fair to say that um, clearing the neighborhood, I'll be honest, I'm, I'm not a big fan of that of the wording there what does it mean to clear something but clearly this object would have dynamically dominated its its region of the solar system i mean all and, of the and, other and that, orbits the, the, the only reason we know it exists is because of its dynamical dominance of that of the entire out of the solar system it is right. i would say it is the most planety planet out there it's dominating the largest area uh compared bigger than any other planet in the solar system so it's it is by far the most planety. In, no in, ter in terms of volume of space, yeah, it's dominating yeah. even more space than Jupiter is. Yeah. 
Wow, that's that's phenomenal. Uh, is Planet Nine the same object as the fifth giant planet in the Nice model? So we think no, but Mike Mike is less convinced of that negative uh, assessment well, than me. Well, we'll just quickly yeah. explain what the Nice model I mean, is. Just a quick it's, quick two it's seconds. A, it's actually the the exact same question as the Nesborny question. Those are those. Are I think so. Yeah, I, I I apologize. Uh, for... But I would. So let me say though that I, you know. Constantine knows what he's talking about, and I'm just a, a dumb astronomer, but I like to make up things sometimes. So I, I kind of wonder if his his story about the timeline couldn't be modified somehow, if you couldn't have things get out into an intermediate org cloud and then slowly, so as, the, as the birth cluster is dissolving, that things can sort of dissolve away too. But, you know, I just like to make things yeah. up, so. I don't know. I don't okay. know. <laughs> so we don't know. I don't know. I mean, like, we, we, but we don't know. I mean, po possibly yeah. they, they threw a, they threw a fifth planet in there, a fifth core in there, and they saw it get ejected. Um, you know, but that of course is a computer model. We don't know for sure. Uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, Hiroshi loves you. Thank you so much for the super chat. Uh, hi, Mike. Have you ever considered that if you hadn't killed Pluto and Eris with Planet X? You could have not only one but two Nobel prizes. Many greetings and love from Germany. Well, at least it was with love. <laughs> uh, thanks, Hiroshi. Um, you know, I, I, let me just say that that uh, killing Pluto, or I will say, uh, helping drive the realization that Pluto should never have been a planet to begin with, I think was actually really quite important for helping to, to drive our understanding of what the real solar system is like. Uh, you know, it, it would have been easy to have jumped up and down and argued that this thing that I discovered was a planet and many of the other things I discovered were the planet, but it, it would have felt fraudulent for a long time. So maybe there would have been two Nobel prizes, um, but I would have felt pretty fraudulent about, about both of them. And I have to say, just because, you know, I want to, is that uh, the, the discoveries of these things in the outer solar system, um, uh, were recognized with, um, with with one of the other big prizes in astronomy, the Kavli Prize. And I think that actually is that the fact that they recognized these discoveries, not just mine, but also Dave Jewett and Jane Liu, as, as important things in all of astronomy, I think was, uh, was uh, really told how important it was, not just the discovery of these objects, but the realization of what they mean and what they tell us about the solar system. Uh, we have uh, another super chat from Martin Stallard, uh, two pounds. Thank you, Martin. Could Planet Nine be a rogue planet? Now, I, Martin, I'm not sure what you mean by rogue planet, but when I hear rogue planet, I think mm -hmm. interstellar planet, just something that's wandering around out there. See what I did? Wander, planet. Yeah. Anyway. yeah, what do you, yeah. What do you, no, so no, could it be a, could be a captured uh, interstellar planet. So uh, it can not be a rogue planet for one simple reason, which is that in order to shape the patterns in the outer solar system that we see and that we use basically to infer the existence of planet nine, you need billions of years of sustained gravitational interactions, right? This is not something that can fly by the solar system and kind of modify its structure once and, and be done with it. Uh, you really need it to be in orbit of the sun and you need it to be in orbit of the sun for billions of years. Could it have been captured from another star in the birth cluster of the sun? Uh, that's one really cool idea that uh, I actually like a lot, but the calculations uh, to date suggest that the, the probability of that is negligible. Um, so you're saying it's possible? <laughs> Who's ever, yeah, there's a chance. There's a chance. It's like that Dumb and Dumber. <laughs> but I, I, I like that idea too. It's a very compelling idea, just because it's kind of fun. But but the hard, dynamical hard the the, the dynamical make, chances are tricky, right? Yeah, basically and, and the, because the third, if you, the third if you possibility have a star... is go ahead, go ahead, Mike. I'm sorry. I was going to say the, the the third possibility is that it actually formed out there, um, which is hmm. not traditionally where we think things that size could have formed and it's a little weird and I don't think it's possible. Um, but it's something we should not discard yet, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, actually there's a, uh, th this dovetails into the end of the super chat. Thank you. So kindly silly man, uh, has planet nine 
has a Planet Nine-like planet been found around a different star? Actually, yeah, just uh, just recently, it's yeah. HD something with a bunch of numbers. <laughs> it's got a license it. plate. Yeah, yeah. starts One, two, three, with HD. Four, five, six, seven. Yeah, yeah. Uh, HD, yeah, I mean, HD one oh six nine oh six. That's right. Uh, that's it. Be- I made a video about it, <laughs> and I kept <laughs> got to memorizing that. So yeah, okay. uh, but go ahead and tell us about it, or what you know. It's about there. It. Mm-hmm. It's what we know about it is that it's is that it's there, and the story for how it got there is basically the one that Mike uh, Mike discussed, right? The one where you know it's it's orbiting this binary star so the binary star can easily eject things and then if you do that while you're in the cluster with a bunch of other stars you park orbit on a planet nine like um you know planet nine like trajectory and so look it's it's cool because it it's not of course it has nothing to do with planet nine directly but it does tell you that objects like planet nine are out there and that the process that makes such objects might very much be generic. I'm having a heart attack uh, because uh, I'm spammed out with a $100 super chat. Holy cannoli. <laughs> oh my gosh. Thank you. While I agree Pluto shouldn't be a, shouldn't be a planet, I feel that IAU planet definition is embarrassingly shoddy work and I don't think we are any closer to understanding solar system object classifications as a result of it. That means do no do more harm than than the end does good. Yeah. So do you if you if you have a couple hours, I'm happy to rant about this. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I, I don't I, I don't I don't actually disagree with um, much of uh, I I'm spammed out's commentary. But I'll, I'll point out that it was it was intentionally. It's not shoddy. It was it was intentionally uh, sort of messed up by the people who wanted to keep the possibility that Pluto might be classified as a planet. So that whole dwarf planet thing was was put in by pro-Pluto people in the hopes that they could make dwarf planets planets. And so really, the, 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 the big problem is that there does not need to be a definition of the word planet. There is no definition mm-hmm. of any other term in all of astronomy. I mean, is there a definition of star? No, there's a concept that we all understand and we talk about. Galaxies, we know what they are. There's no IAU approved definition. The problem is there was a great um, uh, outcry from the public who wanted to know you know, what is and what is not a planet. Textbooks need to write what is a planet and what's not a planet. So the astronomers felt obligated to do it. It's not easy to write down a definition, although it's easy to write down a concept. The concept is the large gravitationally dominant objects in the solar system are the planets. That's a concept. That's it's simple. And it's it's if you understand that, you can really understand what's going on in your planetary system. Once you say that, you can say, well, does this does this fit that concept? Pluto clearly does not fit that concept. Mm-hmm. If you try to make a very lawyer-like definition, has to be round, has to be in orbit around the sun, has to clear its orbit. As soon as you make a lawyer-like definition, you'll get lawyers starting to come up with really stupid arguments. They're like, oh well, Clearly, there are near-Earth asteroids, so the Earth is not a planet. Ha ha ha! And you're like, no, dummy. Um, it's just that you're a lawyer and you're reading this in a lawyer-like way. It's just like understand the concept. Forget about the lawyer-like definition. Understand the concept. The concept matters for the physics for understanding what's going on. The definition is a kind of a sad thing that I wish would go away. I, I think there's there's really kind of like two uh, domains in which we can consider a planet. I mean, look, what, when I look at Pluto. You know, I'm seeing something that's round. I'm seeing something that's going around the sun. It's got an atmosphere. It has active geology. It has glaciers. It sure looks a lot like a planet sure. to me. In the geophysical sense, you know, planet is a perfectly reasonable thing that comes to mind. It's only when you start to zoom out and you start to see its, uh, you know, its its weird orbit. It's kind of drunk out there, you know, along with Eris and the others are kind of, you know, and they're not shaping yeah, up I mean, the, so, uh, you know, the, the, the moon, like, the moon it, is a perfectly good planet in that sense too. And, and yeah, Titan exactly. The moon's, the moon's a planet, planet right? And, and, it, and, uh, and I understand the argument planet. from the geophysical community or the planetary, planetary physics, uh, planetary geology community where, yeah, you know, we, we, it's easier just to call them planet just for the sake of discussion. And I don't have a problem with that either. I guess it's just, I'm looking at it from like, well, I think and I would, can I, your... let me be, let me also be clear that, that, that argument from the planetary geology community is from 
the same three people uh, all the time. It's not a there's there's no widespread mm-hmm. planetary geophysics or planetary geology community that's wanting to change this definition of planet. It's really the same three guys who have been doing this for for 15 years and won't give up. But really, everybody else has moved on. We know it's not a planet. We understand what planets are. We understand the concept, and we're now willing to talk about why there are only eight, maybe we're about to find nine planets in the solar system, instead of arguing about does this count or not, because that's just like the most uninteresting argument that you can spend your time making. Okay. All right. Well, thank you very much. I'm spanned out for that. Uh, Let me get to another uh, question here. Uh, Going back to searching for the planet, given the tough sensitivity requirements, would it be possible, this is from Matt Goodman, thank you so much, Matt, to detect Planet 9 via an occultation imaging technique? That's very interesting. We uh, We found an asteroid or two that way, haven't we? Uh, no. No. Oh, that's right. We found, we found <laughs> rings around asteroids. I'm sorry. That's the problem. And so the answer to that question is no, and that sort of tells you why it's hard. It's a great idea. We I found mean, rings that way. <laughs> we found rings. So once you know, I'm, I'm actually really excited about occultations of, of, of many things, including Planet Nine. Once we find Planet Nine, what we'll do is we'll carefully track its orbit, and we will look ahead, and maybe, if we're lucky, you know, in months to years, it will go in front of a star and and uh, occult that star. It's fantastic when it does because when it, as it goes in front, it lets us probe the atmosphere as it slowly blinks out. We get the size across. We see it come back. We get to see the atmosphere some more. Super exciting stuff. But it's really hard to even find a moment when it happens. And so if you imagine, like, how would you do it? If you could, if you could watch every star in the entire sky the whole time for a year, you might get lucky and at one moment for about, you know, five seconds, it'll blink out because it's planet nine. It's a, it's a tough way to actually find it, but man, it's going to be super once we find planet nine to do some occultations. Can't wait. Look, if you had one moment, would you capture it or would you let it slip? Boom, 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 boom. Uh, uh, Christian, Christian, I think, I think talking, you're... we don't hear you. Try it again with the mute button turned off. I turn, I try to mute myself because I I'm coughing and you know and all that kind of stuff. No, I'm fine. It's just you know something went down the wrong pipe earlier. Hey, you know what? We got another uh, super chat. This is from Cullen Wright. Uh, this one's for Constantine. Our, and, and as I said, as I was saying, but by the way, thank you all so much for the super chat tonight, guys. This is this is super generous. I can't tell you. I'm like having like a little of like a heart attack here. This is just amazing, you know. But uh, are you still of the belief that a ninth planet could explain the six degree tilt of our sun? Colin, thanks for that question. Yeah, it's a good, it's a really good one. I think no. Uh, this is one of the things that was a possibility early on when we didn't know the orbit of planet nine very well. And one of the potential orbit and mass combinations that were allowed by the initial kind of you know, four or six uh, object data set allowed for an op- and a planet nine that would over four and a half billion years tilt the rest of the planets just enough to explain that six degree tilt. Um, with the revised planetary orbit and mass, we think that effect, of course, that effect is still there, but it only amounts to about one degree. Uh, so I think that, no, those two things uh, we've come to realize are disconnected. That's okay. There's, I don't know, a hundred different other ways to tilt the sun uh, in terms of just physical mechanisms that that are plausible. But uh, this one, I think, is not connected to Planet Nine. And it's really it's really too bad because I, I remember the day we first had this realization. We were sitting in your office and we were sitting there with pencils. I'm like, no, look, if it's like this and it goes like this and then it'll twist and it'll be like this. And you're like, no, it's not like this. I'm like, no, look at this. It's like this. It was a it was a fun day. <laughs> <laughs> it's not true. <laughs> well, that's kind of a bummer because I was one of the things that I always liked about the uh, original hypothesis. Yeah. It was looking massive enough to explain that offset, but uh, not quite. Uh, yeah. So, okay, this is a fun question. Also, another super chat. Thank you, Matt Johnson. Uh, This is from Matt Johnson. Uh, It is still from Matt Johnson? Wait a minute. Oh, yeah. When uh, when Planet 9 is officially located, do you have any type of particular celebration plan that you want to do? We're not liberty to discuss very good okay um first first rule of fight club is 
<laughs> uh, Stephen Gold with the five dollar super chat. Thank you so much, Stephen. What became? Did, actually, there is there is one answer. Can I, I can say one answer. This is oh. literally true. I have promised my daughter if once we find it, I will, I will take her and we'll go live in Paris for the summer. That's that's my main celebration. Okay, I think that's legit. All right, yeah. Planet Nine Paris, and if there's yeah. no Planet Nine, don't ever take her to Paris. Uh, yeah. Yeah, good. That's there's good. no Planet. If there's no Planet Nine, we go to Moscow. Okay, there you go. Oh. <laughs> very good. It's very good. Constantine, you know about that, right? Uh, so, Stephen Gold, uh, what became of Robert S. Harrington's observation of Planet X in 1983? You know, you know, that I, I, that's, I, that's a really good question. I don't. I, vaguely, I, 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 I think when I we were I, writing the the review article, we looked into this, right? Yeah, I mean, the answer is there. There was nothing there. Um, yeah. There never was anything there, and there's still nothing there. Um, there were. I actually. I, it's it's funny. I've I've sort of put it out of my mind too. Like, what were those observations? Uh, so the the important point is, and this is this is even though this sounds like it's not important, but it is important. There is no Planet X. Planet X Planet X was a an actual hypothesis by Percival Lowell that there was a giant planet just beyond the orbit of Neptune that was perturbing the orbits of Uranus and Neptune. That is what Planet X is. We've sort of forgotten that and have, have started to use the word Planet X to mean anything out there, but it's the wrong way to use that that term. Planet X is... Percival Lowell's planet that perturbs Uranus and Neptune. And we now know um, from this very nice paper written in 1989 um, by, by Miles Standish that, the, that there, there is no planet X. There are no perturbations to Uranus and Neptune. Uranus and Neptune are exactly where they're supposed to be. Um, there might be a planet nine. There is a planet nine. Um, but there is no planet X. On a, you know, I mean, I, I realize we don't do science by belief or by gut feeling. This is obviously something that you've really done the analysis on. It wasn't a conclusion that you jumped to uh, just because it looked cool. You you were you kind of had to really beat the data down a little bit and convince yourselves that there really could be uh, really likely is a planet out there. If I were to ask on a scale of I don't know like one to ten, with like ten being I mean obviously no one's 100% ten, but you know ten's being like 100% confident. Where would you think you are on the hypothesis right now? Just that it's there, like not what its mass is or its orbit, but what would you rate yourself at? That? Maybe 499 out of 500. Okay, 499 out of 500. Okay, all right, adjusting the I mean, scale. This is, I mean, look, it's, this is a hard one to answer because yeah. um, at the end of the day, you know, we do, we do what we can. We do the best uh, theoretical work, the best observational work that we can and, and keep going. I think, you know, uh, we don't really spend much time, you know, sitting around you know, like, okay, so do you think it's really there, you know, nine out of 10 or whatever? Uh, because, you know, you, you just take, you just go where the modeling, where the data takes you and, and that's it. You know, we're not really, uh, I, I almost like to think that we're not really even uh, there to do it ourselves. We're just sort of, you know, being guided by the flow of uh, you know, the incoming data <laughs> data stream and the and the yeah. simulations. You know, and, I, so, and I was, and I'll I'll say um, uh, to reiterate, uh, and I would say with with new discoveries, it's probably up to one in a thousand. There is there is a <laughs> nine hundred nine hundred ninety nine out of a thousand percent chance that something is affecting the outer solar system. Mm -hmm. The only currently viable hypothesis, this, this is answering um, somebody's question from early on, is there, are there any other viable hypotheses? You know, it's really interesting because when, when Constantine and I wrote this paper back five years ago, one of the things we told ourselves is like, we, we know people are really good at coming up with alternate theories. So there will be alternate theories within 10 minutes um, and we'll have to start looking and see if anybody, any of them makes sense. In, in the five years, there have been there have been maybe two ish attempts. Neither of them have been very successful at explaining uh, all the different aspects of what's going on. And and I find that uh, amazing. Astronomers are really good at explaining phenomena with many different explanations. And the fact that nobody else can come up with a viable explanation, the fact that there's a 999 chances out of a thousand that something's happening, 
it gives me a lot of confidence that what's happening is that there's a planet up there. Now, are there things that we're, we don't quite understand and so our predictions about its location, its size, everything else are messed up in some way? That is entirely plausible. Um, but is there is there nothing going on or is there some alternative explanation? I, I think the probability is really, really quite small at this point. Fair enough. Okay. So something's going on out there. Just got to figure out. I'm trying to get to some more questions uh, here uh, in, in the remaining few minutes. This may be more of like a rapid fire uh, session because I don't want to keep you guys all, all night. Uh, but uh, Eric's asking, how are you? And I'm going way back into the chats, guys. So I'm trying to catch up here. How are you getting so much telescope time? I understand it's pretty hard to get approved for time. Uh, the, the quick answer is you get approved by having a really compelling project. People find this pretty compelling. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, and um, uh, this is perhaps more, yeah, maybe somewhat rhetorical, but it took Hubble 14 years to finally confirm the existence of the exoplanet 9. Why do people think finding our planet 9 will take just a few years? Well, I, I think maybe the, the, the yeah. to start to answer the question, just to kind of qualify a little bit of it, is that it wasn't like Hubble was looking for 14 years. Like people were... You know, there were astronomers who have been studying this particular star, and they suspected that there was a planet there, and they asked for time on Hubble to got to get it. Um, but that also goes to the larger point: why do we think it would? You know, it's been five years, and this is actually something we already talked about. So I apologize for recovering yeah. it. But uh, it it's hard. It's hard. Technically, all you need is three nights to discover it. I mean, that's that's what really? you really need. Uh, but uh, it's got to be the right three nights and you got to be, I mean, it's, it's needle in a haystack does not begin to cover it, right? It's needle in a haystack in a dark room, uh, which is itself embedded within a bunker, which is itself embedded <laughs> within a closet. I don't know. Uh, something like that. And you I, have to stay up all night. <laughs> or or I, th I think I said in my video, something like if you're trying to find that one, you know, l not quite as blue colored drop of water in an ocean. You know, and uh... oh, yeah, it's actually kind of like that. Uh, I don't know the plane that crashed in the. Uh, this was I guess seven oh, yeah. years ago. You know the 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 airliner, right? Um, right. You know roughly where it is. Like yeah. you know roughly where it fell. But the ocean's a big place. It's hard to find things when you're looking for just that one little thing. <laughs> Uh, I know we already talked a little bit about how much time per year you have to search. There's basically a season, you know, whenever Orion is visible. Um, and even then, you're not getting, like, every single night on the telescope. You may only be getting a couple of, a few nights out of the year or a few weeks out of the year, uh, depending on the year. Yeah, we are literally, so it depends. It's a it's a question that depends a lot on the, we have we have a whole sort of nested search. We have hmm. some small telescopes with, with uh, big surveys that are covering the whole sky that we do every single night. They're, they're sort of mini versions of the Vera Rubin telescope, uh, public data set. Um, Planet 9 might be in it. Everybody can go out and download the data, look for Planet 9. So those are nightly. We have some bigger telescopes that cover a more limited space. And then our our, our biggest, our, our, our narrowest search with the biggest telescope is on the Subaru telescope. Um, and we really only get uh, three to six nights a year on that. It's a, it's a very limited resource, but it covers. Yeah. So we, we really pinpoint the places where we really think it might be and where we really think it's going to be the faintest if it is, and we, we try to get it there. So that's, we're headed off there in about a month to go give it Very a try. Very good. And uh, Unnatural Log is asking, uh, some say PanStars has ruled out its existence. Um, I think we may have covered that very indirectly, but do you want to comment on that? Uh, there have been no um, published PanStars analysis of Planet Nine. Um, people may say that, but no one's demonstrated it. Right. Might be true. I actually finished my panstar search so it, it does actually it, it doesn't rule out the existence it's not in the panstars data panstars go. doesn't go very faint so you wouldn't you wouldn't see it uh actually vegas sims asked uh what magnitude do you think it would be given its incredible distance so again magnitude those who don't know it, you know it's a number we assign to describe the brightness of, of an object the lower the number the brighter it is the higher the number the fainter it is planet nine is gonna be pretty faint isn't it yeah 20 Four, maybe? Magnitude 24. Uh, yeah, it depends. So there's, I mean, there's a lot we don't know. We don't yeah. know how reflective it is. We don't know exactly how far away it is. We don't know how big it is. We know how massive it is, but not how big it is. And so there's a wide range. I think 24 is the faint end, and 24 we need Subaru. I think on the bright end, it might be 21. And that's, 
in range of pan stars as this uh, survey telescope on Haleakala. So, so it's a range, and that's why we use this range of telescopes to try to do the surveys. Turn up. And I think uh, Constantine, uh, Lee asked, uh, is it, this may be best directed to you, I don't know, but do you think it could have played a, a role in the drop-off in the density of the Kuiper Belt? At 44 AU, it's, there's not much there. We call it the Kuiper Belt fault drop-off. Uh, yeah. Do you think? Yeah, I think, uh, I think the two things really are, are unrelated. Um, the better explanation for the drop-off at 44 AU is simply that that's where the solar nebula, the protosolar nebula just ended. And there are a ton of, there are a bunch of different ways to truncate the, uh, the nebula. One way to do it is through external photo evaporation. And so really, I think uh, Planet Nine, uh, Planet Nine has nothing to do with, with, the, uh, with the 44 AU uh, drop-off, yeah. Okay, fair enough. Uh, and try to get to a couple more of these uh, really quick here. I'm, we also started late. You guys okay for a couple more minutes? Uh, okay, we yeah. spill over for a few, just a few minutes. Uh, and then, thanks. Um, uh, let me uh, let's see if I can get on to another question that I haven't really, we haven't really uh, gotten to it. Um, well, uh, yours truly was asking, how does the telescope see the whole sky? It doesn't really see the whole sky. You are choosing a region of the sky to look in based on sure, your... It's about if you, if you take your hand at about this distance yeah. and make a big circle, that's about how much we see at one time. Okay. And that's, that's tough because that yeah. means you, you got, it's got a long time to cover the whole sky systematically. Like we, should, we should try making a bigger circle with our hands next time because we keep bigger hand, we, Would that So the trick, is, the trick is to have shorter arms. Well, I mean, uh, but but the Vera Rubin telescope, though, joking aside, it's going to have a fairly large field of view. I mean, it's going to be, uh, yeah. I, I can't remember yeah. how many degrees it is, but it's, it's a, was it like five degrees across, I think? Um, it's it's huge, and it's it's a, it's it's scanning the whole sky all night, every night. So it's, it's going to be fantastic, just fantastic. Uh, this is an interesting question. Uh, I think, may not, I may not say this, would you be surprised if it's, it's a brown dwarf instead? Yeah, we would be super surprised because uh, the brown dwarf uh, has been ruled out by the WISE survey. So there's nothing, you know, ne uh, nothing more massive than Saturn in the solar system, uh, in the distant solar system, out to some extraordinary number of astronomical units, like 9,000 or 30,000 or something. Uh, so, so we would be very surprised. And just to be clear, the the WISE survey that's a that was a wide field infrared survey explorer infrared right so it's looking for it's looking for things that are that are cool that are radiating in the infrared wise would have found a brown dwarf yep. easily yeah easily right okay cool uh so uh let's see uh in fact let me say wise has found many brown dwarves well beyond the solar system so finding one in the solar system is super easy uh so william was William Wester asked, uh, let's see, with the new extreme TNOs discovered, is the evidence based upon orbital alignment stronger or weaker than your publication, thinking of your recent U Michigan paper? Stronger. Yeah, I, mean, I think, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's really, it's one of those things where you can, you can sit around and try to do all the fancy math you want, but it's really hard to just look at that plot that Constantine showed and not see the pattern that's out there. And unless you can come up with some extraordinary reason why all of these objects are clustered the way they are. Um, the real answer is they're just clustered the way it looks. Sometimes things really are just what they seem like. It's, it's there, was, true. there was this very nice uh, uh, XCD comic right after the uh, first vaccine trials were shown and they just had that beautiful plot that everybody's seen where you have the rates of the people who are unvaccinated going up and up and up and up and as soon as the people got vaccinated it went flat and you're like sometimes the best experiments don't require statistics and i kind of think that we're at that level at this point <laughs> great uh let me uh let's see if i can find just a couple of more questions here i really did want to try to get to everybody's uh questions or comments but there's a lot, which is a wonderful problem to have. Uh, we may have to have you guys back on uh, at, at some point, uh, if that's okay. Uh, and don't let me put you on the spot or anything. Feel free to say no, no way to this to this entire audience. Feel free to say there's no way we'll ever come back. Okay, good. So we'll have you back next week. And uh, the, um, uh, well, let's see. I think 
we are yeah okay so we are we are coming up a little bit toward the end of our of our hour here but what i'll what i'll just uh i like to ask you guys a question you know i did a video about this uh i did a video about this topic uh some time ago and um I, I got a lot of comments on it, and actually, we're going back to like 2018. It was a long time ago, and I and I got a number of comments on it. And uh, one of the comments I, I never really had a good response for, and I was wondering if you could help me out with it. Uh, it says uh, we we already know uh, where all you rocket scientists stand. You're all a pack of lying government whores who sold your soul to Satan for breadcrumbs. You're going to cause the death of millions of your friends and neighbors, and you'll be covered with their blood the day you are standing in yeah i mean, oh, man, I thought it, the sad yeah. thing is um was the response smart, to that rand paul 2018 <laughs> <laughs> i would say that the, sad, the sad thing is that if, if we did we, we sold ourselves to the government and it was literally for breadcrumbs i mean really we probably could have done better but but all we got was the breadcrumbs like, well but they, in, in, in fairness in fairness guys they were. They had nice. They had a little bit of basil and olive oil in it. They were. It was. They were good breadcrumbs. They were good. They were very. Good. I put them in like, some, I put like, in some like croutons. Like the kind you get. Okay. Uh, so anyway, I thought it ended up on on that note. Uh, yeah. Hey, folks. This has just been uh, an amazing conversation. And once again, I hope I was able to get to as many of these questions, these wonderful questions, as I could. Uh, but I do want to thank again my guests. Mike Brown and Constantine Batigue and uh, the the hunter the the astronomer and hunters of Planet Nine, um, <laughs> gents. I really hope you find it. I mean, I think it would be in a remarkable a remarkable discovery. I think they're high fiving each other, and uh, as you could see, these are the very uh, you know. Um, yeah, this is the, this is this is Nobel material right here. What you're looking at, folks. This is what we got here. So, anyway, uh, I do want to just uh, close out by saying thank you all once again uh, for coming on tonight, and I especially want to give a huge thanks to my Patreon supporters for their generous support in helping to keep Launchpad Astronomy. Plus, all those super chats, all that helps to keep the lights on around here, and I do appreciate that. I also want to say a huge thanks to Michael Dowling, Stephen J. Morgan, and Morrison Wild for their cosmological level support, and to Anna and to Travis Graham for their intergalactic level support. Now, if you would like to help support Launchpad for the price of a cup of coffee every month, you know, or maybe two cups, just check out my Patreon page. It's right over there. And if you'd like to join me on this journey to this amazing universe of ours, well, please do make sure that you subscribe and ring that notification bell so that you don't miss out on any new videos. Until next time, my friends, stay home. Stay healthy, and please, always stay curious, my friends. Good night.